Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, I am. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it looks like we are just about live at the moment, which is fantastic news. And uh, of course, the first screen grab that the uh, the live stream caught of me was me rubbing my eyes. <laughs> so that that was a, that's a good look. Um, Thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, I'm just getting all the streams set up. So sit tight for just a moment. Uh, we've got some very special guests for this Friday night special broadcast. Um, so bear with me just for a moment and make sure this is all uh, sitting nicely. What's going on here? Why is that going like that? Okay. No, 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 just leave it as it is. Yeah, okay, just in case you see that. Yeah. In case I'm getting next Remember your mic's on. <laughs> okay. Uh, it looks like it's it's we're going live. This is great for the special Tassie chat. This is a lot of fun. I want to make sure this all works, otherwise I will miss out on some of the comments coming through. Yep. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome. My name is Matt Bailey. I'm the National Ambassador for the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society here in Australia. Uh, I go live every single night of the week uh, with special guests, sometimes a solo rant, as you, some of you will know, and I'm very honoured tonight to present to you uh, no less than four guests on the show tonight, which is really, really exciting uh, because we've got, um, there's all these great people in here right now, which you can't see just yet, but I promise you they're here. And uh, I'm going to introduce them all. And we're all going to have a chat about some of the history, some of the current, some of the future of the Tasmanian whiskey scene, what the Tasmanian whiskey scene looks like at the moment and ask them some of their stories. And it's all about the stories and bringing members together like we do uh, every single night here at the SMWS. <laughs> so thank you everyone who's been tuning in. There's a lot of people jumping on live right now. So I'll do a few reintroductions as we go along, but I'm going to unspotlight my video so you can see everyone. And we're all going to have a great evening talking about everyone. So I'm first going to introduce John Jarvis, who's joined us from Devil's Distillery. We've got Bill Lark, who if you don't know who Bill Lark is by now, then I think you need to jump off this stream. No offense. And of course, um, Casey and Jane Overeem of the Overeem uh, story right here as well. So thank you everyone for tuning in. <laughs> yes. We got everyone. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So it's, uh, I'm just going to do a big shout out to everyone who's tuned in at the moment. Thank you so much. Steve, Darren, Adrian, Dan, Crafty, Robert, Birdie, Birdie, Birdie. Good to see you, mate. Uh, Ali, Joel, Danielle, everyone's tuning in. Willa, good to see you all. Um, this is a Friday night whiskey roundtable. It's a chance for us to all have a chat, talk about some of the uh, stories and some of the history and some of the uh, opportunities that might exist in Tasmanian whiskey and your take on those. So I might just start by with John, actually. I might just start asking you a, a bit of a question to you. Um, Absolutely. This is the eve of World Whiskey Day, by the way, as well, because this is, this is a cool opportunity for us to sit and have a dram. Why not? It's the <laughs> night before World Whiskey Day. So. <laughs> Now, I'm going to preface this question by saying we've seen, um, I like to think of different chapters, if you like, or different eras in Australian whiskey. We've sort of got the, the very, very early era. We've got that 1820, sort of 19-ish, 1980s-ish kind of realm. And that was sort of, there was a lot of action then, but a lot of spirit being made in different areas. There's the, the, the realm after that, which I, I guess Bill and Casey had a huge part of here, which is sort of that 1991, 92 era onwards. And then I, I would actually go so far to say that 2014 to now is sort of like that third era in some ways. Yeah. And that, that a lot of that was spurred on by different uh, distilleries. And I, I can safely say a lot of that was spurred on by uh, the Sullivan's Cove Award, things like that. And that's that sort of next realm of putting Tasmanian whiskey on the map. So you started Devil's Distillery in 2014, 15. Tell us some of the story behind it. Yeah, all right. So um, we're, we're a small family-owned distillery. Um, we started setting up in 2014. We just, you know, um, I've worked with a director since then and we just wanted to make whiskey. That was it, just simple as that. I think uh, from memory, we were distillery number 10 or 11 in the state, but we we flew under the radar for quite a while, just sort of concentrating on setting up and doing what we wanted to do. And even now we sort of, 
we're not overly vocal about what we're doing. We're very, I find, I, I think, I feel like we're pretty transparent with what we're doing, but we're not sort of really pushing, you know, pushing that much. And well, we're small, we're basically two and a half operators. So we don't have a lot of stock. We don't have massive volume anyway. Um, but yeah, it's just really, you know, we, we're inspired by the other Tasmanian distillers. Um, it's probably way too early to be going into this, but you know, it's such a good community to be in. Um, you know, uh, Bill Lark, Mark Nicholson, Pat, uh, the O'Friends, everybody's come out to the distillery and seen us. Everyone, we're all good mates, we all get along, and everybody shares a dram, which is great. And, and it's the best industry I've ever worked in. That's yeah, funny. yeah, amazing. And what was the inspiration behind starting uh, Devils then? It, what, where did that idea, what was the genesis of that? Uh, and Hobart whiskey, I should say, for those who don't Hobart know. Hobart whiskey, yeah. So uh, look, we just we just wanted to make whiskey. That's it. We like whiskey. I yeah. especially like whiskey. I like a lot of whiskey, uh, and I really just you know we just wanted to go out and just make this Tasmanian product that we could. We wanted to be a part of the culture and the, the industry and and make the products that we can share locally and with the world. We just wanted to do that. Um, so the distillery is owned by a local businessman and. Um, it's just a family and he just basically lets me do whatever the hell I like. Yeah. Which we're going to get, we're going to get back to that point because you make some interesting product, but yeah, okay. single malt story, I think is, can be largely attributed to one of our other guests, of course, Bill, uh, you were yourself and Lynn sort of kickstarted a lot of this in 91, 92. I'm getting that right. I think. Well, yeah, we got our license in 92. Yeah. Um, but I think having Casey and Jane here is a, a really good thing because really it started before I got my licence. It started with um, getting a little still at an auction. And we'd had this dream for a, quite a while to make whiskey, but um, it might the not trout, have gone. The trout fishing, right? The trout fishing. Yeah, everybody's heard that story. Everyone's times. heard the story, yeah, yeah. It was yeah. a 45-pound brown trout from... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> up road. Anyway, look... Um, I managed to get a little still, but uh, at that stage, all I knew was I loved drinking whiskey, but didn't really know what to do with this still. And uh, another good friend of mine who was a friend of Casey's, is a friend of Casey's, um, said, you ought to go and talk to this bloke down at Blackman's Bay, you know, without giving away any secrets. I think he might be doing something in his garage of a night. And um, <laughs> I went to visit Casey with my father-in-law, who was the health inspector for the local council. I forgot to tell Casey I was bringing him along. But uh, I turned up and opened the door. Casey nearly fell over. But that was the start of, um, of, of where we are today, really, I like to think. We, you know, um, we put the still together and um, we played cards and we drank a bit of grog coming out of the still. And um, it was really the inspiration for me to get going straight away. And I, I'd like to think it was the inspiration for Casey to fulfil one of his dreams to eventually start a distillery as well. Um, and that night was a great night in the garage. Casey will remember every time a car went down the road, we ducked under the window. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great night. <laughs> the whole, the whole, I guess, Tassie industry then has come like a, a, an awful long way since then, as evidenced by even like uh, John's story as well. So, Ka Casey, what are what are some of your recollections of that of that sort of early era, that sort of nineteen eighty nine to ninety two sort of era of of spirit? Um, yeah, the uh, Bill's Bill's now he's uh, he certainly um, yeah puts a bit of uh, uh, spice with the story, which uh, uh, isn't is isn't untrue. But um, yeah, the uh, the he's an um, ambassador. He's allowed to embellish. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but we uh, it was it was really a um, uh, a start to um, to the to the industry. I think yeah. um, I'd been uh, messing around. In the shed for some years, um, with a with a, a so-called still, but it wasn't really uh, in today's terms. You wouldn't even call it a proper still, um, and I was only really producing neutral spirit. Um, but that was the uh, the start of the industry, um, or the start for me. And yeah. then uh, to meet Bill, um, and then to, to to start producing with a, a proper little copper still um, was the next level, and. Um, yeah, is, is that the still that's sitting still in the in in the cellar door at Lark still today? Is that? Oh, that's a slightly bigger version of that little still that Casey. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, sure. Just a scaled up version of it. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, and my original one was a plastic urn. <laughs> I remember. With a uh, little, yeah, plastic. little copper pipe coming out of the top of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that went into a, uh, a coil, which was inside a little Perspex box, and that was the uh, condenser. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was uh, it was a bit of fun, but it was uh, pretty amateurish. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and what, what year was it that you finally got that still in your sort of the shed beneath you, that lower down from your house there? Uh, that, that came about in about uh, 2005. So it was some right. uh, 10 years after Bill. Um, although um, I had been messing around again, probably a little bit more professionally um, prior to that still being uh, installed mm. in, the, in the shed. Um, it, uh, it, it was the beginning of Overeem or the old Hobart distillery. Yeah, right. So there's, like I said, there's a long, uh, a lot has happened between sort of that 05 and 2015. That's, and it's only 10 years that the, that's, it's changed so much. Uh, what have you, Jane, in your, in your experience, I mean, cause that's, that's more closely linked to your, uh, your career in it as well. Uh, I think it may have been 2009 or 10 when I first met you. Uh, and it was, there, there was that, you were uh, you were at the you were at the distillery and you were involved with it then. Yeah, so around 2009-10 was when we were distilling. So I learnt to distill with Dad in those early years, um, and then it was end of 2011 when we launched Overeem, and that's when I really got involved. Um, early 2012 was when I um, I packed up and went to Sydney with a boot full of whiskey, um, and that's when I started sort of. Yeah, really starting to get over him out there and getting to know people at the bars and restaurants and bottle shops and and that's when I really really fell in love with the industry. Yeah, I, I actually recall you showing me your uh, early sketches for different bottle designs. Yeah, 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 I remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah a folder full of different sort of uh, different ideas for what Overeem would look like on a bottle. Yeah, there was a dog jumping over a river. I'm glad we didn't get that one. Again. Yeah. <laughs> that was over the Eam. Over the Eam River in Holland. All so. right. <laughs> and what was the <laughs> and where did the decision come from to use Overeem as a as part of the brand rather than Old Hobart Distillery? What was the the idea behind that? Um, that was um, that that came about through a um, uh, through a guy that we commissioned in WA and um, he was coming up with certain ideas and I, I commissioned him to come up with a name for our, um, for our whiskey, as well as, um, you yeah, know, sort of um, to design the brand and the image that would go behind it, mm. behind that. And um, anyway, he started playing with certain things. He was very professional, very, very good. And um, he came up with, uh, he rang me one day and said, Casey, he said, we've, We've designed it and we think it should be called Overing. And I said, well, I said, if you're going to call it that, I didn't need to commission you because it was the last thing I really wanted. <laughs> I said, I yeah, didn't right. want to <laughs> it after the pen. Um, anyway, yeah, after he showed me the design and he said how balanced the name was and that sort of thing and uh, that it would fit well and that it could be easily recognised worldwide um, and easily spoken. Um, like you can you can imagine that there's uh, a lot of brands from Scotland and that that people find very difficult to pronounce to pronounce. So a Bruick Laddick or something like that. They look yeah yeah. The they people still get it. Don't worry. I won't order that over the bar because I don't know how to say it. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, he said over him. He said anybody can say it, and they look at it and it's an easy thing. And he said so that was an important uh, part, and I thought it was very very valid. You could say the same about Hobart. Whiskey, or you could say the same about Lark whiskey. Really, it's 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 Absolutely. a yeah, yeah it's that's yeah. A clever decisions from all there. Um, Actually, that, John, I still can't believe you managed to register Hobart whiskey. That just still astounds me. Yeah, I, was, I, was, I, I don't was, know why it wasn't registered. It um sort of baffled us as well. That's for sure. Getting yeah. getting uh, getting the name Hobart whiskey is is yeah. a pretty is pretty uh is pretty cool, especially for for getting that in 2014-15, as you said. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> 
Well, um, I don't think we actually knew we wanted to call it Hobart Whiskey when we started, which is why the distillery itself is called Devil's Distillery. We just sort of started getting things done and the brand came later. Yeah. Um, well, speaking of which, I mean, it's I've sort of asked a bit about the last 10 years in, in, case, uh, in the case of Jane and in some of those stories that have been in the last 10. I think a really interesting sto- uh, question I'm going to ask next, but before I do, uh, we've had a, quite a few people ask, what are we all drinking tonight? So I just want to grab those on the comment sec- section coming through at the moment. So, uh, John, what have you got in your glass? <laughs> uh, so I have this unnamed, unlabeled bottle of oh, yeah. <laughs> whiskey. <laughs> Um, distillery x yes that's right yes the, the bottle may look familiar though so um normally friday nights i find they're really good just to sit down and sort of pull samples obviously quite large cask samples to you know yeah for the weekend <laughs> uh bill yourself what have, what have you got in the glass well i've, I've got the my favorite it's the lark classic cask and i'll tell you why it's my favorite later and it always has been but when I finish this very shortly, I'm going to be drinking my daughter's whiskey, Kalara. Ah, a bit of Kalara. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So I've got a couple lined up, ready to go. <laughs> yeah, it's always good to have a plan. Yeah. Um, uh, Jane, uh, Casey, what have, we, have we got a dram in front of us at all? Yep. Yeah, I've got Launceston Distillery tonight, supporting uh. one of the other Tassies, and I'm really enjoying it. Actually, we've, Mark's enjoyed most of the bottle, but... <laughs> I'm just trying this one now for the first time, and I'm really enjoying it. Which bottling is that? And, and for me, it's a no, Mule Stone. Yeah. Um, from Holland, being a Dutchman, I thought I'd better support the Dutchies. Yeah. yeah. And uh, <laughs> quite enjoying a little Mule Stone here. Um, yeah, lovely I stuff. I'm in Holland. And uh, for those wondering at home, I'm predictably drinking an SNWS single cask. I'm going with a 26 dot. 136 candy floss and carousels, which is a, a nice, uh, brisk whiskey from a waxy distillery. That one, uh, uh we're getting a, a, a thumbs up from Millstone from Oliver there. And, um, Crafty, I hope that answers your question. That was one of those questions was from, um, Oliver, uh, uh, sorry, from Crafty Field there as well. Um, we'll grab some more questions as we go along, but, um, I guess what the next one of the next qu- questions I want to ask you as a group as well, just to take each of your takes on this, um, was uh, just looking at sort of the next, looking at the next ten years in in Tasmanian whiskey, and I'm talking quite specifically Tasmanian, as I think it often has its own, well, its own identity within the Australian whiskey landscape. Now, one of those points, if you want to touch on, is of course about I, I know there's been efforts in the past to, and maybe still is. I haven't been following it as closely. I'll, I'll admit, but there's been efforts in the past to form an appellation uh, to for all the spirit. I'll ask, I'd like to ask you all, do you think that's a good idea? Do you think it's achie- achievable? And what does that look like for the next sort of the next in- development of Tassie whiskey? And that's a big question, but Bill, do you want to kick us off on that one? Yeah, look, it's, it's a, it is a big question, but it's a very important one. And it, it sort of came around about, we probably started thinking about this Appalachian idea about, I don't know, five years ago or more, when it was apparent that around Australia, um, people were sneaking in, spirit from overseas and calling it Scottish whiskey, and it wasn't. Um, And it occurred to us that as Tasmania was building up such a good brand, we needed to protect ourselves from that sort of thing happening. Um, Imagine if somebody got a hold of some rubbish neutral spirit and went to the home brew shop and bought a whiskey essence, added that to it, and they, at the, at the moment even, they're quite able to call it Tasmanian whiskey. And imagine if it was bad and rubbish and people thought, gosh, if that's Tasmanian whiskey, we don't want it. And so we thought we really need to protect the really good quality and the good brand that we built up over the last 20 years. And so we went down this path of, of trying to achieve an appellation. And I think it's something that we'll look at across Australia eventually. But we thought we'll start with Tassie because... Certain things can happen in Tassie being a small state and we've got really easy access to politicians and things. Tasmania is where the wet tax that is now across Australia started from here in Tasmania. And so with help from Tasmanian government, from ASIC even, um, and even federal politicians, we've been putting together um, the start of what will be a um, uh, a geographic indicator for Tasmanian whisky. Um, it'll be the first such thing for a whiskey in Australia um, uh, and in any anything like it. And um, 
we're hopeful that that'll come through. We've had to work on the definition. That caused a little bit of a, an interesting debate amongst some of the distilleries. What is Tasmanian whiskey and how far do we go in protecting those things that make Tasmanian whiskey, Tasmanian whiskey? Or even Tasmanian spirit, it, yeah. talking more broadly. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, but I think we've worked through that now. and We've reached a really good uh, understanding of what that is. And we're just working through the process of getting that geographic indicator approved by ASIC. And, um, uh, and then uh, we've, we know we've got the support of the state government in this. And once we've done that, it'll, so there'll be a definition for Tasmanian uh, whiskey and a definition for Tasmanian single malt whiskey. And I think if we can achieve this, right. we'll be able to then go to the ADA and across Australia and develop a, a, an appellation for protecting Australian whiskey australian single models yeah yeah i i recall um i was actually um it was a conversation i was having with uh robbie gilligan um mm -hmm. a, a while back a, a few years ago now and there was a i don't even remember the brand but it wouldn't be good if i did anyway because i wouldn't announce it but it was a there was a, a gin there was a tasmanian gin being made a while back which was uh the spirit was all being imported from a distillery in adelaide or something yeah, like it was, but it was being labelled as a Tasmanian gin, and it was sort of like, well, that's not—is that really Tasmanian gin? It's not really. It's no. So yeah, it's just an effort to try and avoid any any confusion and and just protect not from anybody within the industry, but it's to protect the brand from um, you know things that happen outside of our control. Yeah. Uh, John, yeah, what's know, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Go on, Bill. You you were talking about you know, where we've come from in the next 10 years. And so just sort of leading into that, I'd like to think we've really been through the golden era. We've had the golden years of, um, of this industry, mm. and certainly here in Tasmania. Um, and I, I, I'm not saying that's going to end, but uh, we started from a base of nothing to quite a number of distilleries where we've all really worked on being a collegial group of people and that's helped grow the industry across Australia. And it still is extremely collegial. I think we're just about to enter another era, though, where some of the distilleries ha are going to go big. They've got corp become corporate. And I don't say for a second that's a bad thing. No. Um, and I, I'm, I'm sure they're still interested in making very good whiskey. But um, what, what I think one of the challenges for our industry going forward is to make sure we hang on to that collegial attitude. John mentioned it before. You know, it's a wonderful industry to be in where you're all good mates with all the all the other members of the industry. That's a wonderful thing. We want to hang on to that more than anything. Well, I was actually going to ask that a little bit later on about, um, do, do you, you don't, I get the impression as someone who comes to Tassie often, but not, it doesn't work directly in Tasmanian whiskey. I get that uh, impression that it's, there's, there's not too much fierce rivalry between the distilleries. You, you don't see too much of a, a sort of almost, you know, fist fights between uh, Casey Overham and Bill Lark in the, on the high street. Um, which is which is a nice thing, and that's often the opposite of a lot of uh, I think American distilleries, where you do hear of all these crazy stories of distillers punting each other on and stuff. Yeah, look, I think there was the potential for for us to lose that, but uh, I think we all really love that aspect of what we're doing so much that you know we do still want to work together with each other, and we still want to remain good friends, and um, and that's even with the big distilleries. You know, you've got. Uh, people like Mark Littler with Hellyer's Road, and look how big they are. But Mark is just as much a friend as uh, any of the as the smallest distillery, and he yeah. works with us. And he's now the president of our association. Um, yeah, you know, yeah you can be a big distillery, but still we can all be collegial and still remain good friends. I think. I think in terms of your comment about scale of distillery as well, I th I, I think we'll see more uh, scale of distillery, especially on the mainland, perhaps yeah. as we are as we already are. But it's. Uh, it, it, it could also happen more to Tasmanian whiskey as well. There was a little bit of a debate going on social media a year or so back about what is a craft distillery. And yeah. people were trying to define what a craft distillery is. And people were trying to come up with, oh, if you're over certain litres, then you're not a craft distillery. I honestly think that doesn't matter a rat's bum whether you make one litre of whiskey or you make a million litres of whiskey. I think the important thing for us to remember is how you make that whiskey. That's, yeah, I, that's I, I the definition of craft whiskey. Well, yeah, you have to come down to defining what the word craft means to begin with and then work out scale is unimportant in that respect, I would say. Well, I think scale is totally unimportant. It's about how you make the whiskey, yeah. 
Uh, John, in that original question of thinking about the next 10 years, uh, I'm sure in, in some capacity you've at least thought about what Devil slash Hobart whiskey looks like in 10 years and what Tassie whiskey looks like in general as well? Um, yeah, well, you would think that we had a, a, a good 10-year plan, wouldn't you? Um, <laughs> me and so our, maybe, a three year, of, maybe a three-year or something. Yeah, <laughs> well, maybe like a three-day plan if we're, <laughs> we're lucky. Um, so I, I work for Director Rocky and uh, we sort of, we're both very similar in the sense that um, uh, we, we talk on the phone a lot and we discuss a lot of ideas, but it's just like a big bowl of spaghetti. You know, we're sort of still just trying to pull strength out and know what we want to do. Uh, so there are a few things that we, when we started up, we knew what we wanted to do. And that was, um, you know, basically I, I just make whiskey that I like, essentially. That's it. i um, got a, our head distiller, Ben, now, who does pretty much all of the operations. I, um, I, I don't really know what I do. I'm just there doing something uh and basically you know we just solely concentrate on making whiskey that we like and we put it out to the market and and that's it 10 years from now um we we don't really have big plans to scale massively we don't want to like i think i said we're a, we're a two and a half man operation it's Dan, myself and my wife works with us part time and it's just what's your what's your what's your output at the moment your production look like uh, so we have an 1,800-litre pot still from Peter Bailey. Uh, at the time, it was the biggest one he'd made, I think. Uh, and we do about... Good surname, two, good surname that Peter bloke, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. 200 litres a week, basically. That's uh, where we're sitting. And um, look, we, we could do it's more. quite small, yeah. yeah. We, we could do less, but we're just... Right now, we're just concentrating on making the best product we can, making the best new make, doing the best brewing, all, all the brewing on site. Um, and then we can think about scaling it up if we decide to. Uh, but but running a distillery is is hard work and it's yeah, yeah. work. <laughs> and um, you know, as fun as it is, we just we don't know if we want to go too much bigger. We just sort of want to find this sweet spot and then think about growth and what we're going to do. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Um, in uh, and Casey uh, and Jane, how how about for you guys? I mean, it, sort of, you've also had you've had an interesting trajectory through Overeem Distillery. And then Jane, uh, you and your partner, uh, husband Mark, um, with Salford Distillery, and then now, um, now everyone knows the news. You've uh, you've got the Overeem name back. So, what does the ten next ten years look like for you, but also for what you what you see as Appalachian and the Tassie industry as a, as a whole? What would be the crystal ball from your end? You go. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, as you said, Matt, like our plan, plans have um, significantly changed. Um, Mark and I were two and a half years into production at Salford Distillery um, and, yeah, we were ready to start from scratch again um, with some five-year-old whiskey in 100-litre casks in 2022 and um, we were just chipping away. Um, and then, yeah, it was late last year that we were approached to get the brand back and... Um, and now we're we're almost there. So end of June, we we officially take the brand of Overeem back. So um, yeah, our plans change pretty quickly, but uh, obviously a, a great a great um, exciting thing that we can now yeah move on into the future with Overeem again. And um, yeah. and we actually plan to launch another brand in 2022. So that's pretty exciting. Um, you heard it here. So you heard it here first, folks. <laughs> Breaking news. <laughs> yeah, you did. You actually heard it there first. So, yeah, awesome. Um, yeah, so that's going to be pretty fun. So two brands under the Overeem Distillery into the future. Um, so, yeah, 10 years for us looks really exciting. We're going to have 10-year-old whiskey, 12-year-old whiskey, 15-year-old whiskey. Can't wait. Yeah, wow. Yeah. yeah. Which is an interesting point about age statements that we can jump back into later. Um Whilst we're whilst we're just at this point now in our chat, I might grab some of the questions from um, some of the crowd, and anyone can answer these. Um, uh, Crafty asks, as a, as a mainlander distillery, how does Tassie promote Tassie whiskey, but at the same time promote Aussie whiskey? Curious how it works. Um, like, like, as far as I'm concerned, you know, if I'm specifically talking about Tasmanian whiskey, I will talk about Tasmanian whiskey. But wherever I get the chance, and especially if it's in an international arena. I will talk about Australian whiskey. Yeah. I think that's really important to me as much as it is Tasmanian whiskey. Yeah. Um, I don't have a problem with that. And, and, and I, you know, um, 
but you, you have to think about it from time to time, but uh, to make sure that we, we're we inclusive of the whole of Australia, that's that's an important message, even as a Tasmanian whisky, to, to make sure that when we go to the world market, we are primarily an Australian whisky. Um, yeah. So, you know, there, but but uh, there's no doubt about it. I guess we've, we've um, created a Tasmanian identity a bit like Isla, a bit like Highland, a bit like Lowland. It's just a regional area, a regional um, branding situation. But that's no, a good question from Crafty, and um, I'm sure Crafty talks about, you know, where he, you know, Capitan and where he comes from, but he's still an Australian whiskey at the end of the day, I'm sure. Yeah, well, especially, uh, I guess he says he's a mainland producer, so he only, he talks about a, a Australian whiskey rather than as yeah. a category of Tasmania, um, which in that, uh, Ian Scott actually had a question regarding that last question. Uh, will a Tasmanian appellation restrict the stiller's ability to experiment slash produce different styles? That's a very good point. Uh, what do you reckon, John? Do you think that an appellation might be restrictive or? No, I don't think so. I mean, uh, when we, we sat down as, a, as an industry and drew up sort of what we wanted it to be, and I, I don't feel it was, we'll restrict anything at all, uh, much like Bill said. It's more just about uh, the industry has grown phenomenally over the last few years, um, and just to ensure the quality is of, of the highest quality that we can all produce, I think it's important to have it there to protect protect the industry in Tasmanian whisky. Yeah. Um, but in terms of restrictions, um, uh, don't quote me on this, but I, I'm pretty sure we didn't restrict it to being Tasmanian barley. Um, mm. You know, it, there's still a lot of lot that can be done. It, it shouldn't yeah. be restrictive at all. No, no. And um, there was also one more one more question here from Chris Cornell who is a distiller himself over at Archie Rose, who's following in tonight. And he asks, um, in terms of classifying single malt, uh, would this be following the Scottish model that uh, spirit production has to be has to occur in a single location from brewing fermentation through to distillation? What do we think about Casey? Do you want to weigh in on that at all? Um, my understanding uh, of the single malt as far as Scotland was concerned was that it was, uh, uh, that it was from a uh, single distillery. Um, and not necessarily brewed on site. Um, I don't see that it is necessary to brew um, to brew the the you know to brew the, uh, the wash the, the, the wash on site. It's probably for the smaller distilleries. Um, it, it's it's quite uh, handy to be able to go to a local brewery and pick up your wash and distill it. Um, and I don't think that would take away from it being a single malt. No. Uh, Bill, any thoughts on that? <laughs> um, Is that a can of worms comment? Is that a can of worms? <laughs> it was a fairly contentious issue. I can't exactly recall how we uh, ended up with it, but uh, I don't have a problem whatsoever with um, buying your wash from a brewery and then, and then bringing it to your distillery as long as it's made to your specifications. <laughs> Um, and I could have a big distillery where my brew house is in a separate building to my distillery house, um, and I've got to brew, bring it from that brew house to the still house. What's the difference between bringing it from a brewery down the road if it's made with your yeast regime, your barley specifications, everything else, your sparging temperatures? I really can't see the difference. So on a personal level, it doesn't worry me. I know there's some debate going on on some of the social media sites about um, you know, distilleries that are, aren't brewing their own wash aren't really making a, a, a proper single malt whiskey. You know, look, I can understand some people feeling that, but personally, I don't have a problem with it. And I think it's what's really enabled the Australian whiskey industry to, to, to get to where it is today, that most of us started by buying wash in. I certainly mm. did. Uh, I used to buy my wash from a small microbrewery um, but at some stage, I was desperate to brew my own wash and I couldn't wait to get my own brewing facilities. And that's okay. I did eventually, but I I, I, um, I needed to go down that path to start with. Um, so, look, I think uh, it's one of those things where it's helped the industry to grow and I think we don't want to discourage people from coming into our, our industry. Um, mm. And if that's what it takes to get started, I think that's a great thing. Yeah, Okay. Anyone else, want, anyone else want to jump in on that one? Otherwise, it's all, I'll, I'll keep moving on. Um, uh, so, yeah, it, there's, a, there's a good question that has come through, which is actually kind of very close linked to, to one I already had down here. Um, in terms of challenges ahead for 
for the category of Tasmanian spirit, or, or let's we could narrow it to Tasmanian whiskey, of course. Um, for some of the challenges ahead, some of them that I thought could be identified would be uh, procuring uh, a steady source of wood and, yeah. and a steady source of barley and a steady source of other uh, raw materials that are needed. Uh, is there, and, and of course, talking in market as well, uh, the question that came through from David Taylor here was uh, with 56 odd distilleries in Tasmania, can we, do you think that they can support more? Or do you think there's a bubble waiting to burst? So it's sort of like it's a, an in-market question, but it's also a, a raw materials question. <laughs> Uh, let's just focus on the first, focusing on that first point point for a second. Uh, the supply, the the demand on wood is obviously quite a quite a um, an issue. Could be an issue, and it's uh, something I want to just take your chew your ear on a little bit here, just to, as an idea. And Jane, have you do you want to start with anything you can any challenges you see there in terms? Sure. Of- yeah, I've I've definitely seen it change. Um, first of all, I mean the prices have obviously gone up, which is which is just you know, that's fine, but it's actually, um, yeah, sourcing the good wood. Um, when when Dad and I, or when Dad was sourcing wood early, um, when he first started Overeem, all the all the port and cherry casks he were getting in were, you know, 100 plus years. Or 50 years 50 plus. 50 years plus, um, hmm. you know, and that was just what was coming in, whereas now um, we have to, that's a special order for us to get the, the really good wood. So, yeah, it's definitely um, it's definitely a lot harder to get now, which is is one of our big challenges. And Mark and I are doing a lot of work in regards to that. Um, yeah. And it's all through. It's all mostly one channel as well. It's, it's just well, I mean, for a lot of for a lot of oh. distilleries, it's a lot of it is um, is through TCC or is is direct source, and yeah, it, that yeah. must present a challenge as well, being almost like a not. Monopolistic. There are other ways to get wood, but of course, it's it's uh, it certainly has its challenges in terms of supply. Surely, yeah. Well, our, cooperages, yeah. our cooperages are doing such a great job in yep. sourcing good wood. You know, they'll ring us as soon as they find some good stuff that they've been able to secure, yeah. how many barrels, what they can give to us. So, you know, we are really relying on our cooperages at the moment to do that. Um, and I mean, I know a lot of distilleries are having to, you know start looking into it a bit themselves and yeah it is definitely getting challenging well, yeah and on on uh, on that note i think um that there'll be more um whiskey matured for the long term in um american oak bourbon casks uh and um that they will be finished in uh in the port and uh, sherry barrels and um and wine barrels rather than putting it for the full term in the uh, in the wine barrels that we've been used to and in the fortifies. I, I mean, on my view personally on that is that I, I think the more bourbon wood we see, the better. Um, I, I think it's a I think it's a staple of the whiskey industry around the world, and there's no reason why it can't be a staple of the Australian whiskey industry as well. Uh, Bill, you're about strategy. to uh, jump. Oh, sorry, yeah, that is a strategy that um, that I think the Salford Distillery are moving towards. Um, and of course, it, it's time. It takes time because you've got to put um, your 200 litre barrels down um, a little bit longer, unless you cut the bourbon down to a 100 litre barrel. Um, but this is quite costly. Um, and so I think to mature them in the 200 litre barrel um, is, is most cost effective. And in the long term, we'll bring the price of Australian whiskey down, uh, which I think um, is also. <laughs> something that we can talk about at some time. Yeah, that, that, I, I will touch on that. Trust me, I'll get to it. But uh, you, you can't, unfortunately, you can't have a conversation about Australian whiskey without talking about pricing. Um, Bill, you were going to jump in on there. Sorry. You, on oh, that. Look, just to add to, you were, you were making the comment that uh, you mentioned one cooperage, but we're lucky here in Tasmania that we've actually now got three cooperages. Oh, I need to update my list. There you go. You do. And, uh, and, and as Jane mentioned, they're still able to find some good wood for us. Yeah. And uh, um, we, we've gone through a period when I started, I was able just to go to our local cooperage and I could get pretty much whatever I wanted. Um, but as the number of distilleries grew, of course, we've seen the industry grow. And it's not so easy just to go and get the, the barrel that you would like. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that we liked to do was to put our whiskey only once in a, if it was an old port cast or a sherry cast and, that was it. We, we had the luxury of being able to go and get another um, first fill port or sherry. That, those days have changed, but 
and <laughs> refills. We're seeing we're seeing refills now being used, which I think is is an interesting move, and and I'd, I'd say if executed properly, a welcome one, surely. I think it is now too. I I really liked the idea when we started. It was at a time, and I, and look, I I've always lo- I, the only reason I got into this was because I love Scottish malt whisky, and the industry, the Scottish industry, has been a tremendous help to us still to this day. Mm. But it was at a time, and I think they they were talking about it themselves when the demand for Scottish whisky had grown so much that they were using first, second, third fill barrels, and there was discussion about how some of our great Scottish whiskies whilst they were still fantastic, weren't the same as they were 20 or 30, 40 years ago. Yeah. And um, so I came along and thought, well, this is great. I can just continue to use first fill barrels only. And I think for a while that was good. But, look, I put my hand on my heart and look back and I think to myself, you know, some of our whiskies were probably overcooked with some of those characters. And what I'm discovering now is, and I was very nervous about putting whiskey in a bourbon cask, and I guess it was because back then a lot of bourbon cask whiskies had been second and third fill bourbon casks and hadn't contributed much to the whiskies. Now what I'm discovering, and I think Casey and Jane have talked, and John I'm sure will feel the same, Tasmanian whisky seems to work really, really well in a bourbon cask, and I'm loving that. Right. And uh, Jim Murray has made the comment often that he thinks um, a second fill barrel produces a much better whisky than a first fill barrel. Well, when it, I was able to get plenty of first fill barrels, I disagreed with him. But <laughs> on reflection and over time, um, I'm tending to agree with uh, Jim and people like Charles McLean, who's said it as well, that I think some of our better whiskies, if you choose your barrel properly, will come from a second fill barrel. So this whole barrel issue is really, um, it's becoming a challenge, as Jane mentioned, getting the barrels you want. We're moving into an era where we're starting to look at second fill. Um, Casey mentioned that we'll be using some bourbon barrels like they do in Scotland to mature and then finish in some of these other barrels. All that's facing us right now and is ahead of us, and that's going to produce some um, exciting times for us, I think. Uh, yeah, that, that is interesting. And I, I also want to jump uh, over to John on this. As a, as a relative newcomer to the scene, uh, relative, sorry, I mean, five years is a long time already. But as a relative newcomer, however, it's um, how, is it, how have you seen you, uh, your ability to source wood in that time, especially when you're jumping in uh, when so many established players are obviously have contracts and fills already with, with cooperages? Yeah, so I guess um, we, we still sort of got in to the industry a little before the big boom. Uh, one yeah. thing we did was we, we sort of foreseen there would be a bit of a shortage of oak. So we invested pretty heavily. Uh, we actually dropped a container straight to Tasmania. Um, we were, uh, back then, Adam Bone from Tas Cars Company was, you know, guiding us for what we should be doing, what we should be getting. Um, and because we're producing such a small amount of New Max Spirit, we don't probably don't have as many challenges as some of the bigger distilleries because we just don't have the spirit to put into wood. And it just gives me a bit of, I guess, a bit of uh, flexibility, a bit of I can sort of cherry pick what what comes across to us. So um, obviously, you know, the, all these elements are so important for making good whiskey. So our early days, we were buying Moobrew wash. We decided we wanted to do our own brewing to have that element of control. Um, we try to make really good, clean spirit and we try to get good wood. And we just, because we're doing such a small amount, we feel like we can tick most of these boxes most of the time for now. Um, but one big thing at the moment is cask seasoning um, is happening a lot. We, you know, it's something we're looking at doing and we've experimented with. We did a rosé cask. I mean, who else does a rosé cask? It's just we yeah. have a bit of flexibility there to try these different things. Um, and not having those kind of SWA regulations that dictate you can't use this type of wood or this type of seasoning. That's would, right. Would for some interesting rosé casks and red gum wood and stuff yeah. like that that I've seen a bit of going around. Yeah. So I think it's just um, one thing that I'm very conscious of is I just want to disclose exactly what people are getting. Just be transparent. This is not matured in a, a cask that had rosé for 20 odd years. This is how we've done it and what it is. Um, just having accurate information and even, you know, we, we do a lot of finishing. We do, we marry casks together because ultimately we're just trying to get a really good end product. That's what we're aiming to do. And 
I think just having a bit of an open mind to do that has helped us sort of accomplish that along the road. There was actually a question just before from Joel Bradbury who says, uh, how, how do you all feel about the seasoning process that the likes of TCC are implementing? And um, they, they can sometimes season barrels in just hours. I don't know if that's true or not, but um, it, that, that's, but um, it, is anyone else here got any um, takes on seasoning going on at the moment, especially for Cooperages? It's, it's obviously not uncommon elsewhere in the world. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know probably enough about it, but we've, um, yeah, sat down and tasted some really good seasoned cast, did a blind tasting with a fair few of them. And, um, yeah, we were very surprised that some of the ones that we loved the most were from seasoned cast. So we yeah. couldn't tell the difference between some or we just we, we actually preferred them. So, um, but for us, I guess, yeah, it's just one of those hard decisions to make. You know, you put something down now and you've got to wait five years to know whether it's going to be good. So, um, I definitely would like to try it, but it is one of those um, sort of big decisions that you, you've got to make internally. Yeah. Uh, there was a comment from Peter Bignall here who's been watching along, and Peter says, uh, when I started 10 years ago, there was one Cooperage in Tasmania that wasn't getting enough work, and now, as Bill said, there's now three, uh, which is, which is, obvi- which is a, posit- it's a positive comment. It's, it's, it's showing the growth of the, of the industry, and that's, I think that's a really good thing. I, I can imagine there'd be four or five before not too long, especially if it, if it keeps growing. Um, uh, there's also um, there's a long question here from Joel Rinaldi. I might have to come back to that one, but here's a question from Dan Woolley, who's tuning in as well. Hi, Dan, yeah. who, uh, who we all know very well and 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 uh, and used to be a uh, brand ambassador. And, uh, and welcome to the Australian Distilling Scene, Dan. There you go. <laughs> a proper a, 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 a Um Dan says, hey, you gang, what's the general consensus of a junior ducket seasoning a cask with Coca-Cola and then yeah, aging a new mixture to make it a whiskey? <laughs> Can't comment until I tried it. No, Mr. Ducket, <laughs> if it's a good whiskey, I mean, yeah. If it's a good whiskey, it's a good whiskey. <laughs> Who's tried it? Has anyone tried it that's watching? I, I don't know if anyone's tried it. I mean, apart from, apart from um, Louis, I don't know if anyone has tried it. I think it's just a, a work in progress, but. It's kind of that there's no law saying that can't be done. It's as a Coca-Cola seasoned wood. So there you you've go. Got to love, you've got to love the ducats. Yeah, you've got to love it. <laughs> True madness. It's fantastic. Um, Sam Licardi, who it works in the Tassie whiskey industry himself, says, um, I love seeing Tassie whiskey in bourbon casks. I think refills are going to be great for the Tassie spirit. Yep. I, I tend to agree. And, and it, oh, I'm just going to, just on that point still, there's a lot um, – there's a lot of great ex-bourbon uh, whiskies coming out from around Australia, of course, and some who have been doing it for a very long time, like the likes of Bakery Hill and whatnot. But yeah. there's, there's a, I think seeing t- uh, ex-bourbon wood and even great refills uh, can, can as, as Bill, you were saying, they can impart an incredible flavor, especially if used over a longer period of time and in a larger format cask. And if it's a good, if it's a good spirit, it's going into a good cask. Or if I'm um, to paraphrase your old quote, which I might get a bit wrong, um, shit in, shit out. And if it's... <laughs> that's a good, yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, Crafty says that rosé cast, mate, was very interesting indeed. There you go. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, here we go. Uh, Paxarette. I know I spelled it wrong, but thoughts. I know Mr. H loves it, but what are, what are our panel thoughts on Paxarette? Have they stopped doing that in Scotland now? Hmm. I'm gonna I'm gonna go yes I think or I don't I haven't seen any uh, Scotch whiskies that have been influenced by it but I, you do see it in Taiwanese whiskies quite a bit and you yeah. see it in a lot of new yeah. old whiskies but yeah look I, I don't know it's a it's a question we should discuss and we haven't really discussed it because uh, as Jane you've talked about yourself um, going into the future we're going to have to look at seasoning barrels uh, and I think a smart distillery into the future will probably look for a supply of fortified wines that they can put into casks and leave for a number of years and then move on to other barrels as they decant those to put their whiskey in. I, I mean, that's no different to buying a, a port barrel from Portugal um, and yeah. maturing your whiskey in that. Um, and so Paxarette, that's, uh, it's kind of an, an intense fortified, isn't it? I guess um, in some yeah. respect, uh, um, I don't know. Look, I, I, I don't have a, an opinion on it one way or the other, but I think it's something the industry should talk about. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I just want to jump in on that, otherwise I'm going to get to Joel's longer question here. I agree. Oh, good. Uh, so Joel says, uh, I've had some, I have, I've had and currently have 
some fantastic Australian whiskey. But at the same time, I've had some very average ones as well. I love supporting our local whiskey industry, but there seems to be a faux pas around criticizing Australian whiskey sometimes. It's almost un-Australian. Uh, do you think uh, it's necessary to offer feedback to new distilleries in regards to this? And how would us as consumers go about it without the distilleries feeling insulted and disheartened? It's a very good, it's a very good comment because it's often, a, as, you, as you all know, it's a, it's a labor of love and you're producing the spirit and you wait years for it to mature. You put it in a bottle and then someone on social media says, this tastes like garbage. It's like, it, 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 it's, it's got to hurt. So it's kind of like, how do you offer that kind of feedback? Is that feedback necessary? Is that, do you like reading uh, criticisms? Is it, how do we all sit on that? John, I'll start with you. Yeah. So um, look, I think it's, uh, it's an interesting question. I personally, I love re getting feedback on any whiskey we put out the door. We have a, you know, somewhat rigorous tasting panel that we'll go through to make sure it, it ticks the boxes we want with whiskey uh, quite often I'll send samples out to industry people, friends and other people I know just to get feedback. Um, but ultimately, uh, whiskey, one thing I love about it is everybody's got a different idea of their perfect whiskey. Uh, you know, this person may love it and this person may hate it. So uh, just after we did our first release, uh, Cam Brett from Spring Bay rang me and he was like, John, I'm so excited. Just remember, some people love it, some people hate it. Just make what you love and you'll be right. And that's essentially all we do. Uh, if somebody didn't like our whiskey you know someone can walk up to me and say just didn't like it I can say why didn't you like it if they just stand there and don't give me a reason that's all right I'll still respect that but um you know I especially we're quite new to the industry uh, we're still learning and we we appreciate this feedback yeah uh, you know where there's still so much to learn I I feel like everybody people just learn forever so any feedback I, I wouldn't see it as unpatriotic or anything like that it's just you know it's a labor of love like you said but um, so is everything. So it's painting a house. If you paint a house because you're a painter and you do a shit job, then you know, wouldn't you want somebody to tell you you do a shit job? Um, you know, you'll get better. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> um, Bill, I mean, your story is kind of self-explanatory in that in the, in regards to that question. You were, you wanted to produce a whiskey that you would drink, like yeah. you wanted to recent, like that's what the den genesis of Lark was. I mean, I'm guessing yeah. it's the same with you, Casey. You as your your stories of traveling overseas and seeing those uh, those little distilleries under house distillers and shed distillers and coming back saying, why can't we do this here? I mean, that's. Yep. In a nutshell. And um, we did try to produce something that, um, that we would like. Um, and of course we were sort of in the pioneering stage where we didn't know whether we'd be able to sell our whiskey at all. Uh, when Bill, well, Bill, especially, but even myself, when I started putting it in barrels, uh, you're only going on by what, uh, yeah, the new make was good, so you just had to had to um, <laughs> trust that the barrel would do its job and that the that the whiskey would be accepted by the market at the end of the day. Um, and fortunately for us, um, it did, and um, it was accepted. And I think um, for a lot for most distilleries, their whiskies are accepted. And, uh, um, but I, I have got a comment to make here that might be a little bit controversial, and that is about the. Uh, the, the very small cask aging, I think it's a little bit hit and miss, uh, more so than if you're going to a 100-litre barrel. Um, if you're mucking about with 20-litre barrels, I think that you've got um, a, a, a chance, a, quite a high chance, that um, a percentage of your whisky is going to either over-oak before it's got any sort of maturity attached to it, so it needs to be re, um, re or you know, um, finished again in something else to try and bring it up. And uh, so I think the sooner that distilleries, the smaller that, you know, the, I know you've got to start somewhere, but I think um, the sooner that they progress beyond the 20 litre barrel, mm. the sooner that they'll get a, a higher quality whiskey. It's, it's funny you say that. And it's, it's, it's something I can actually, I don't think it's that controversial. I think it's a, it's a, a take that has been more and more being widely accepted in Australian whiskey production that, these twenty-liter barrels have not be, have been mostly to the detriment of, of the spirit, rather than to the to the benefit of faster aging. Uh, and I'm one of the people that doesn't believe there's such a thing as faster aging. I think it has to time is time, and you can't cheat that. Um, but it's it's uh, that's an interesting point. And then it's um, but like I say, I, I agree. Everyone has to start somewhere, especially if it's a new distillery. But it's uh, that the twenty-liter thing. In fact, on that very on that very point, one of my most recent visits to Tasmania, I was. I was visiting someone over at um, a colleague over at uh, Sullivan's Cove 
and I, lo I look down from the top balcony at the the casks area there, and they're they're rolling all these twenties uh, to be disgorged to be put into two hundred liter casks. Yeah. I said, well, they, they said these twenties aren't aren't working at all, so they were taking the bungs out of all of them, rolling them into a into a vat to fill into to re rack into two hundred. And I thought mm -hmm. smart decision to at least admit they weren't working, and it's a I guess it's a waste of a lot of wood as well in the in the end. Yeah, they're expensive yeah. barrels too. Yeah. yeah, twenty liters. Yeah, they were fifties, I believe. Oh. We bought some um, off uh, Sullivan's Co. Um, they were fifty liter barrels. I'm yeah. not sure if they were the same ones that you're referring to, but they also were decanted and put into 200 litre barrels. Yeah. Um, and I actually bought some of those 50 litre barrels because um, I thought they'd be very good. They'd had short term uh, maturation and mm. were already, in, in the distiller's opinion, were already over oaking. So um, that's why they decanted them for a different maturation. And I thought, well, now's probably a good time to try a second fill. <laughs> so uh, we've now filled them with new, mate. All right. Okay. So what happened to the 50s that you bought? Where where, the, where did the spirit go for those? Just the empty barrel, Matt. It was oh, all sorry, empty we, barrel. Just the yeah. empty casks, yep. And sure. so we filled them with new, make, and we'll just see what happens. Bit of data yeah. private collection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just get it, just put a kick, kick on the bar case. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bill, what... In the early days of Lark, what were you filling into mostly? Because I know it's a lot of hundreds and two hundreds now at Lark, and uh, yeah. but... um, our very first barrel was a five liter barrel. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the trouble with that was I just about drunk most of it before it was ready. To <laughs> but I can tell you, the very first bottle that ever had excise paid on it in Tasmania since eighteen thirty nine came out of a five liter barrel. There were only five bottles <laughs> by the time, <laughs> five small bottles. Yeah, we've, yeah. We've broken four of them. I've got one left on the top shelf behind me um, from that that first barrel. But uh, look, it, it is an issue, uh, uh, an interesting topic, and Casey's sort of spoken well about it. Um, but having said that, some of the best whiskey I've ever had's come from a twenty liter cask. And in fact, about three years ago, um, a whiskey that won the best whiskey, uh, best Australian whiskey. A single cask whiskey in the in the World Whiskey Awards came from a twenty liter cask, um, but there is a danger, and Casey mentioned it quite well. You have to watch these casks so well. Like you know, at two years they can be terrific. At two years and three months they've gone over the top. You, it's that critical. So provided you're diligent about the watching the cask and being ready to take it when it's ready, you can actually produce some stunning whiskies. And so. Um, I think for a distillery starting, it's a it's a good way to get a whiskey out into the marketplace sooner than later. And you you would only do it for that reason because, as Jane mentioned, they're expensive. It's a very expensive way of maturing whiskey. And as Casey mentioned, there's a danger that you can overcook them and spoil it and end up with a whiskey you can't sell. Um, yeah. Look, looking back to my early days. Um, I didn't know, like Casey said, I didn't know whether anybody was going to buy our whiskey or not. And I remember we had our first release in 1998 um, and we only had a few a few bottles, not a, not a big release. And um, a Scottish chap came into the distillery and he said, what is it you're doing in here? You're not be making whiskey, are you? And I said, as a matter of fact, we are. He said, <laughs> well, you better give me a taste. And I said, I'm sorry, sir, I can't give you a taste. I've only got a small amount. I can send you a taste for $3. <laughs> he goes, well, got his $3 out. And he said, well, pour me a glass. I gave him a taste. He went straight to the back door and I thought he's going to spit it out. And instead he yelled out, hey, Mary, come in here. They're making whiskey and it's not bad. And he bought three bottles. Yeah, very I thought, cool. Okay. You know, um, but, but that was a good experience, except with my hand on my heart, I look back to those first releases and – I actually think, in hindsight, they were probably still too young, you mm. know. And I think a lot of distilleries made the mistake that I made. I, and I put my hand on my heart. I made it. I released some of my whiskies too soon because I needed cash flow. I'd managed to convince myself that it was all right. Some people were buying it and loving it. That's great. Um, but, you know, um, I think uh, nobody likes criticism. Um, you know, we all ask for it, but we hate it when we get a, a, a critic, a critique that's not favourable. Um, 
but I think we've just got to toughen up and learn from it. It's a, it's a very important part of um, growing this industry. Um, yep, sure. I mean, I know people, strangely, that don't like Lafroy, but it's a cracker of a whiskey. Look, it's okay to be wrong sometimes. Oh, uh, no, that's right. That's what I'm, and I think that's what Casey was alluding to. Not everybody's, or John, sorry, not everybody's going to like every one of our whiskeys. No. Um, sadly, I'm one of those people, I'll drink anything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, look, um, uh, it, it is difficult, and yes, I know some people are copying a bit of criticism. Um, it's, but some, well, some of that criticism is around pricing, which is the, sort of one of the points we wanted to touch on. Before we get to pricing, however, there was a um, a, a question from Darren Howie, and he was asking uh, how how closely does the Australian wine and whiskey industry work at all? Oh, that's, that's poorly phrased. Sorry. Do the Australian wine and whiskey industry work at all closely together? The quality of our Australian wines, you'd think would mean that there should be great quality casks for finishing or, or for even full maturation. There's a fair few Australian wine casks, obviously, around. I mean, some distilleries mature exclusively in them, if you look almost, you know, like, a, of course, like distilleries like Starwood and others, like it, it utilise wine casks quite a bit. Well, the way I, I think of it, Matt, is that what is a fortified wine barrel, Port of Sherry? It's, it's a barrel that's had a, a, a fortified wine um, matured in it. And what is a fortified wine? It's a wine that's been stopped during fermentation with strong alcohol. So um, using a wine barrel that's been shaved and recharred and putting strong alcohol in that barrel is a bit like a deconstructed fortified wine. Yeah. Um, and from some of the wines that I've tasted, and I, the very first wine uh, whiskey I ever tasted from a wine barrel was Glen Goyne, matured in an Australian Shiraz cask. It was a cracker of a whiskey. And it it had all the characters of a great sherry cask whiskey, if you like. It had those floral toffee notes. It was it was a ripper of a whiskey. Um, so yeah, look, I, I think into the future there, there is a relationship we can have with Australian wine. Yeah, awesome. And and in your case, uh, John, what's your what's your cask? I mean, as you said, you using you are experimenting a lot and marrying a lot and using different things. But is there sort of a cask policy or size that you're uh, not or? necessarily. So I guess I have um, a bit of a, a personal prejudice against small 20-litre casks. Uh, we have eight or, or nine now on site total. Um, much like what Casey said, I just feel like they're very hit and miss and we're, we're small and maybe we just don't have the resources to keep an eye on them. Um, but that's not to say that, you know, everybody sort of treats things differently and has a different opinion. That's okay. Uh, so we we landed a container a while ago of quite a few 40 and 50 and 80 litre Hero distillery casks. Uh, so that's what we've primarily been filling. Um, I feel like 40 and 50 litre is the sweet spot for the, these, you know, so-called quicker maturation whiskies where mm. um, we're in a bit of a unique position as well where we're not really suffering from having to get whiskey out the door. Um, right. I mean, it's what we're in May, mid-May, and we haven't even done a release for 2020 yet. Mm. Uh, we're we're very patient. The director is very patient. He knows it takes time, so we can just wait until the whiskey's ready. Um, yeah. We're moving to a larger, moving to a lot more larger casks now. We've filled quite a lot of hundreds. Uh, we've got some 200s on site, 300s. I've bought a couple of big port pipes just because I think they look really fucking cool. <laughs> um, some people think that I'm batshit crazy for not cutting them down into small casks, you know, 50 year old pour pipes. But the reality is, we have no pressure to get whiskey out the door from these casks. So we can leave them for 10, 15, 20 years, whatever it takes. Uh, and because of that, we, we have a diverse range, like literally just good wood, just good finishes, buy it in, yep. work out if we want to finish something in it or. Uh, or, you know, just new make a cask and, and go from there. We don't really have anything set in stone. Yep. Uh, very cool. Um, there was actually a comment from Richard Matthews here that says he's commenting on the 20 and 50 litre casks at Sullivan's. He says, that was a painful process. <laughs> and um, <Yeah>. and, uh, <laughs> and uh, Gary says, uh, not too shithouse as a classic uh, Bill quote. Yes, of course you can't. You can't have Bill in the stream and not the not too shit house quote. Yeah. Uh, I've got a Lafroy bottle that's got on the label "not too shit house." Ask Dan <laughs> Woolley about it. <laughs> Dan's commented a couple of times. I'm gonna have to. Oh, here he goes. He says he got Dan actually got ten of those fifty liter Sullivan's casks too, uh, and he's since refilled them with um, uh, Tawny, and they're in the, his garage seasoning for the next six months before he fill, starts filling them with peated Newmake. 
Very wow. cool. Oh, I'd really be interested to try them in the future, Dan. Good on you, Dan. There you go, mate. Um, and uh, Richard also says that Old Kempton worked very closely with the local vineyards. Yep, that's very cool. That's And, of course, that would work. Um, and the Crafty says, however, he he, um, he falls on the other side of the equation. He says, uh, in my opinion, 20-litre uh, casks are great seasoning for cask vattings. Like I call them the salt and pepper of casks, the seasonings yeah, of casks. Good. Okay, very cool. That's good. Good comment. Um, and I feel your passion, John. Exactly. David King says that. Fantastic. Um, so I'm, so I'm uh, just just for everyone who's been tuning in and everyone, uh, all the new people have tuned in as well. I'm here tonight. We're chatting with four absolute legends of the Tasmanian whiskey scene. Bill Luck, Casey and Jane Overeem, or should I say Sawford? Sorry, Jane Sawford as well. And um, and John Jarvis from Devils slash Hobart Whiskey. This is um this is a great uh, this has been a great chat. Uh, it's this has been really good and I'm taking some great questions. One of the topics that we wanted to touch on tonight, which has been, there's been lots of questions and comments about, is about pricing and about and where how Australian whiskey is perceived. Uh, and we'll touch on it both on nationally, but also internationally, which I think is an interesting discussion. If, if I can just uh, preface it by saying, I think the first ever ovary in my purchased, uh, <laughs> yeah. I, bought, I bought directly off you, Jane, and I bought it in the, in the shed. And uh, I paid you cash in hand and it was, I think, $350. 300 or 350 somewhere around there. Oh, what? Yeah, it was a, it was, yeah, yeah, it was a car strength. It was a port cast car strength OHD 004 or something like that. Uh, oh. And uh, I can't Oh, remember. yeah, okay. That was the yeah. first release. Yep. Yeah, first release. And uh, I think it was 300 or 350 or something and, and somewhere around there. And I remember <laughs> thinking, yeah, okay, well, that's what Australian whiskey costs. And, and I realized that I'd be able to buy a bottle here and there for that kind of price, but that's definitely not sort of your daily drinker kind of price. And and I and I was, I was sort of I was ready for that. And then uh, the industry changed a lot over the last ten years, of, especially in terms of pricing and, and perception of pricing. Uh, if I'm to remark on one tidbit from my history was when I went to the uh, launch tasting for the very first New World projects from Dave Vitale and his uh, new distillery in, in Starwood, and he uh, he launched this New World projects bottling. It was 700 mils, which was unusual for Australian whiskey, except for Overeem, of course, and a few others, but. Uh, it, was, it was a 700 mil bottle. It was cask strength and it was a hundred dollars. And we went, no, that's, that's not right. Mm. It's like, no, no, they're a hundred. They're just project bottlings and everyone rushed for them and they were sold out in minutes. And it was sort of like, okay, well, this is a bit of a turning circle. And it's a bit of a, bit of a, a strange shift in the price of Australian whiskey as a whole. And then of course, rewind, what, two years ago, we saw twofold and we've seen, of course, I'm talking examples from bigger distilleries in many cases, but uh, with economies of scale to be able to support that. What are your takes on where pricing sits? What what will the market bear, and what do you see it as being uh, a strategy moving forward? And perception. Um, look, Matt, I thought you were going to say when you were first in the distillery with me, and you bought a bottle of Overeem for ninety dollars because that's what it used to be. Wow, you really you really did rip me off. There. That's fantastic. <laughs> you yeah, said great. three fifty. I was like, what? Oh, yeah, wow. <laughs> no, definitely um, wasn't ninety. No. Uh, <laughs> I think I bought a 40% yeah. one for 90, maybe, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, 43. 43. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, look, yeah I watched the, the price of Overeem rise since we started in 2012. So, yeah, it did go up a lot from 2012 to now 2020. Um, but it went up as it got uh, hard, to, hard to get. So, right. you know, supply yeah, supply and demand because, um, mm. you know, we I think the – at one point, it was probably 160. That was probably where it was probably at its most um, popular, I think. Um, yep. And you probably remember, Matt, like I'd put a barrel online and reach out to the mailing list and it was gone in a couple of minutes. A bit like yeah. Dan I remember those days. I remember those days. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah, it was sort of around those times that the pricing was going up and, and also, yeah, there wasn't a lot of Tasmanian whiskey to buy. So, um, I'll let others comment on on the rest of that, but yeah, it is continually changing. I mean, you. What were you going to say? Oh, my 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 thoughts on it are that um, you know, at two hundred and forty and two fifty a bottle, um, and some of these are only in five hundred mil bottles, um, and also, uh, yeah, the 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 age. I mean, the age doesn't really come into it, but they've been matured in um, twenty liter casks, um, and and often. Um, are not they haven't got the depth of character um, so 
I think they're overpriced. Um, yeah. I would like to see the um, a, a premium Tasmanian whiskey um, around the one ninety to two hundred dollars for a seven hundred ml bottle. That would be my uh, my aim. I think that's a fair price for a for a crafted handcrafted whiskey um, in today's market. Mm. It, it's that's the thing. It's in today's market. It has to be. Uh, it has to be competitive, not just with Australian whiskey, but it's it's the 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 choice of uh, the consumer's choice on the shelf these days is wider than it's ever been uh, from all world uh, from all around the world, of course. Um, Bill, your thoughts? Yeah, this is um, it's an interesting question, and um, when I started, mm. I could have charged whatever I like. I suppose I didn't have a clue, mm. but I was very fortunate that somebody said, "Bill, there is a." formula for working out how to charge for your whiskey to make sure you stay in business you know at the end of the day you you charge what you need to charge because there is a cost of production there's mm. a cost to getting it to market and there is a an industry formula in the in the liquor industry that tells you that you know once you know your cost price and that varies from distillery to distillery so i don't think we can pick a price and say that, that should be applicable to all distilleries um, mm. Each distillery will have to work out what, and a, and a really good craft and small craft distillery is probably going to have to charge more because their cost is going to be more. Mm. Um, and so as long as you're getting that basic margin on top of your cost price, which becomes your distributor price, and we know a distributor wants 25% commission off wholesale, and then when the when it gets sold to a retail outlet, they'll want to put a margin of 25 to 35 or more percent on top of that. So you can work out what your retail price is. So when we started, we, we used that formula to price our whiskey, knowing mm. that if we did that, then we should be able to stay in business. We should be covering our cost of production and allowing for going to market and running an office and running a cellar door and things. And, and that's worked pretty well. Our very first release was $78. But in time, the cost of production went up, barrels, cost of barrels and everything else. Do you have a time, have a time machine somewhere that I can borrow just for a day or two? <laughs> yeah, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> pick, up some, um, pick up some LD001 for, uh, for 78 bucks. That'd be nice. Yeah, wouldn't that be good? <laughs> Look, um, I, I think... Tim Duckett talks about the market correction. He's even put out a whiskey called the market correction. And yeah. I think the market will determine what it's prepared to pay for our whiskey or John's whiskey or Overing whiskey into the future. They'll look at, they, they, if they want that whiskey and they understand that it's cost that distillery a certain effort to get it onto the marketplace, then Maybe $150 is the right price. Maybe $250 is the right mm -hmm. price. And if you want it. And I know, I guess, um, I know some people have to be price conscious. So, um, but if there's a certain whiskey I want, um, you know, I look at the price, I might shudder, but I think, now look, I really want that particular whiskey from Scotland and I'm going to pay $300 for it because I really want it. Um, yeah. I might not buy one every week, but at that particular point in time, I want that whiskey and I'm prepared to pay for it. Um, well, so you, you've done you've done that as a as even a society member yourself. I remember the number of uh, three dot something you bought you bought of us at one point. Well, they were <laughs> sensational, and <laughs> they were worth every cent. And they weren't <laughs> cheap necessarily, but it was something I really wanted at the time. And so, pro, pro, I don't think you know it's it's a, something we're going to be talking about forever and a day. Um, and I think I think the market will sort sort things out. You know. Yeah. Um, Anyway, it, it, yeah, we'll keep talking about it for a long time, Matt. <laughs> no, no, it's it's an evolving discussion. Um, John, from your perspective, it, it especially again breaking into the market mm. is, is an interesting point in your in your perspective as well in more recent years. Yeah, so I think Bill touched on it really well. Like, um, you know, people will people will pay what they want for a product. Uh, the market drives the price of whiskey. Uh, in our situation, in our case, all I knew is that um. We wanted to go sub two hundred dollars for our five hundred ml whiskey. Our first release was one ninety five. Um, we've since been working to make it, I guess, more approachable. Ultimately, I want people drinking our whiskey. I don't want people just buying our whiskey and putting it on the shelf to collect dust. Like we want to share our whiskey with people. We want bars to be pouring. We want people to be buying and taking it to barbecues. And to achieve that, I guess we need to make it accessible. Um, yeah. I mean, I 
justify buying really nice expensive bottles with my wife by saying it's going to go up in value i'm going to put it on the shelf it's just, yeah, i just drink them i just yeah. drink bottles and i drink everything i buy um and it's, it's just a market but even beyond production costs tax all that sort of stuff i think it's the story and the engagement with the customers and the connection and people buy into that and people want to be a part of the brand and um, you know, I feel like 90% of the customers will just be happy to pay whatever you want them to pay because they want to be a part of that experience. And they know they can ring any of us up and have a chat and they can come and see the distilleries. And we're all really quite small in the grand scheme of things. Um, and, and that's worth that small premium as well. Yeah, yeah, indeed. And that's, I, I think that's part, it's part of that journey, isn't it? And that, mm. that's going to change over time and you're going to have to adjust, I guess, According to market and 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 what's and what's going to suit the market as well, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's do a bit of quick fire before we um before we finish up. Um, there's a few sort of a uh, few questions that are that have been jumping in here, and when I say a few, I mean lots. Um, <laughs> so, but some of them are definitely sort of yes or no sort of uh, I think answers. So we'll do a bit of a um uh, a bit of a quick fire round. Uh, okay, here's a good one. Uh, what do you what do you appreciate least in a whiskey? And this is just sort of a, a general comment. I, I, I can get the ball rolling by saying, uh, for me, it's um, sherry cask sulfur taint. I, I don't. I, I enjoy a sulfur whiskey, a spirit sulfur, but I think a, a, the sulfur taint from a sherry cask can sometimes put me off a little bit. But um, what do you appreciate least in a whiskey, John? Do you for want to kick us off? Oh. <laughs> for me, it's uh, dry. Dry. I stand having a whiskey and going. Ugh. Too dry. Okay. Yeah, yeah, dry on the palate. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, Bill, you, you've uh, you've had a fair few drams. You might you might uh, be able to answer that one. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, 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 look, I throw you one things, curveball tonight. Come on. When I first started drinking whiskey, there were things I didn't like. I didn't like whiskey matured in a bourbon cask. Um, mm-hmm. But then I learned to discover that we shouldn't get too fussy about a particular style of whiskey because if, if you think about it, there's a time for every whiskey. There's a time when everybody wanted a peated whiskey and nothing else would suit them. And, and I used to say, look, I love my peated whiskies as much as anybody else, but um, don't forget about some of those beautiful, delicate floral whiskies that, you know, they're good whiskies too. Don't put those aside. And yeah. there's, a, there's a time and a place for a, um, a, a whiskey at breakfast. I mean, you know, everybody knows I talk about a breakfast whiskey. and um, oh, yes. <laughs> I, um, I usually wait till seven in the morning, but... Uh, but <laughs> but but there's a you know like if I'm with with certain friends up in the Highlands with a campfire going, there's a type of whiskey that I'll appreciate there. Um, there are times when I thought I didn't want a sweet whiskey, but there are times I like a sweeter whiskey. There are times when I really appreciate a dry whiskey. It's um it's a strange thing, but I think what I've learnt to do is, and probably I'm guilty of having too many whiskeys. I've learned to appreciate all the different styles, but at the right time in the right place with the right people. Yeah. Okay. That's uh, you, you're truly a diplomat sometimes, Bill, and I appreciate that answer. Uh, John, what would, how would you go? I feel like Bill stole my answer. I was going to say whiskey is very much for me a mood thing. Um, you know, I bought, and don't hate me for this. My first ever experience with Laphroaig was I bought a bottle of Laphroaig 10 on a whim. I got it home and I absolutely hated it. It's the worst whiskey I'd ever had. <laughs> um, and I've got a workstation and behind this monitor, I've got, you know, a few open bottles that are easily accessible. Um, <laughs> and uh, the Lefroy sat there for a while and then just one day I was like, wow, I could actually really just go this like Lefroy whiskey. Um, and so I think what Bill said is, you know, pretty similar to what I would have said. Uh, it's just, there's a time and place, um, you know, the most sulfur infused whiskey or the driest whiskey or, or this or that doesn't mean that I don't appreciate it. Maybe I just don't feel like it at the time uh, in, in the right company, in the right mood, at the right time, um, just anything. Uh, whiskey, you can break it down. You can just go through, you know, nine things you love and one thing you hate. And uh, that, that one thing may just overpower at that time, but the next time you go back to it, it might not be an issue. Yeah, awesome. Um, there's been some uh, lack of finish has been some of them. Uh, chewing on a dry stick, hate that. Dry, I agree with, says um, Peter Bignall. Uh, uh, lots, lots, of, lots of comments on that very question as well. I'm going to finish with one more quick fire. Um, otherwise, we could talk all night. Um, for each of you, who is, your, who is your hero in whiskey? Now, the reason why that question is there is because a lot of people will say, 
Casey over him is their hero, or people will say Phil Lark is their hero. So in many cases, I like to know who your hero is in your whiskey journey, someone who's been almost like a, an inspiration or mentor or guide for you in your journey. Uh, Jane, kick uh, us off. Uh, for me, it would be uh, Matt Bailey, Bill Lark, Casey Overham, and Jane <laughs> Overham. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer, John. Yeah, yeah. Good well. one. The Tasmanian distilling industry has been so supportive. Like I look up to all these people. I really, it was a quick, quick question you asked. I'll give a really quick story. So uh, when we first started up, I remember I rang up Bill Lark, you know, the godfather of whiskey. I'm going to ring him up. And I spoke to him. like, no, you come out, just sort of have a chat. Like, look at what we're doing, try some casks. And um, I was petrified, like what to expect. And Bill come in and he, he brought Mark Nicholson. And they sort of sat down at a cask and had a whiskey and a chat. They're talking about fishing and motorbikes. And I was like, is this the industry? Like, this is so <laughs> relaxed and cool. This is exactly what we want to be doing. Yeah, um, yeah, very cool. You know, much the same, you know, all pretty much all of the Tasmanian distillers have come out at some point. I can ring anyone up and say, oh, this cask, I don't know what's happening with it. You come out, you have a chat, try it. Um, so it's a bit of a bit of a shitty answer because it's, you know, non-committal. But the Tasmanian oh. industry has sort of helped guide me and they're the ones that I've been looking up to uh, so- for our journey. So who does the Godfather look up to then? Who was your hero? Well, if you say John Grant, I'll accept that as an answer. But I, um, uh, uh, it, it, strangely enough, that's exactly what I'm going to say. I, uh, but I will say quickly before that that uh, the whole of the Scottish industry has been a tremendous source of inspiration to me. Um, but a couple of things happened to me the night that Lynn and I said let's start a distillery. We toasted it with a 15 year old Lynn Farkless. Mm. Two weeks after getting my license, absolutely shitting myself because I had no idea what I was doing, the phone rang at 10 o'clock at night and it was John Grant from Glenn Farkless. And I'm going like, shit, John, how can I help you? And he's going, nah, Bill, how can I help you? He said, uh, I hear from a distributor in Hobart that you've got a license to make whiskey. Would you let me help you make good whiskey? And we've talked on the phone for a long time. So I have to say, in all honesty, you know, um, it was spooky that, I toasted it with a Glenn Farkless, and I remember saying to Lynn, wouldn't it be great one day if we could make a whiskey like this? And I'd like to think, I'd like to think we're getting very close to that. Um, but for him to ring me at 10 o'clock at night um, was tremendous. So mm. um, John Grant, yes, he, he's the guy I would have to tip my hat to uh, first and foremost, but then there's a whole host of other great people in the industry. Oh, that's yeah. Been yeah. Just as helpful. And uh, Casey and Jane. Well, for, for me, um, yeah, Bill. Of course it's Bill. Yeah, there we go. That's nice. <laughs> oh, uh, Bill, Bill. You can have a Zoom moment, a Friday night Zoom moment, folks. Do you get the warm and fuzzy through your, through your screen? <laughs> yeah, Bill's a hero to me, but I, I have got some others there. And, um, I mean, we had um, – we've had uh, – we, you know, Bill and I went together to Scotland back in 2005, and we met a lot of great people on that, on that trip. And um, a few that come to mind was Jim McEwen, and I've um, had dealings with him uh, a, a, a number of times since. And uh, I suppose he would probably be, uh, I, I love his gin. I love his, uh, you know, his, his whiskies. And, um, yeah, generally, yeah, it, it's yeah, just, just generally a good bloke. You know? Yeah. Yeah. True. Jane. Well, you probably all know my answer to this one, but it's obviously this man right here, Casey. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's got the deepest pockets. No, yeah. no bias at um, all, right? No bias. <laughs> no, 100%. It's Dad all the way. I've, um, I've, I wouldn't be in this industry if it wasn't for Dad. He introduced it to me at the ripe old age of... 18 and I really have loved it ever since and um yeah he's just always been behind us to to keep going with it even when he sold over him there was never you know a doubt in my mind that he wasn't going to support me in pursuing um my dream in the whiskey industry um and now to have over him back where it where it started is even more awesome and yeah we just we have so much fun together it's given us a an awesome relationship and an awesome bond, decanting barrels together and mucking around with whiskey. It's the yeah, it's, it's awesome oh, and yeah. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, well, all each of you have been a, a part of uh, my whiskey journey, obviously. And I've uh, John, we've done we've not known each other a very long time, 
but uh, um, but in the case of all the rest of you, I've, we've known each other for a while, and I, I think it's. I just want to thank you all uh, so much uh, for taking uh, time on your Friday night. Uh, I know it's 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 much easier during isolation, but I'd like to think this is the kind of thing we could do uh, even outside of isolation. And I feel like this is the kind of conversation that, with the great questions from members, the great uh, commentary, and the great sort of I guess even sometimes digging a bit deeper on the surface of sometimes the Tassie whiskey industry and giving those an insight into what's happening uh, both day to day and long term is is uh, they find fascinating. I find fascinating, and it's I want to thank you all so much for being a part of this uh, tonight. So thanks again. Uh, thank you, everyone who's been tuning in and asking so many questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to absolutely every single one. There's been heaps and heaps and heaps of comments on all the channels that we're broadcasting to at the moment. Um, we'll be back next week for the live stream, of course, kicking off Monday night. Uh, the guests for all next week have all been locked in, so it's, we're looking forward to a big week again next week. So, uh, of course, I'm going to try and get some sleep over the weekend, and I um, appreciate Thank you so much. John Jarvis, Bill Lark, Casey Overham, Jane Sawford, thank you so much for all being a part of it tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, everyone else. Thanks, Thanks Matt. Thanks, everyone for tuning in. Stay on, stay on for the moment, guys. I'll um, I'll catch you all soon. We'll see you all for the um, uh, the stream starting back on Monday. That's Monday night. Next Monday night, we've got some really special guests lined up. I'll see you all soon. Signing off, Matt Bailey, Scotchmore Whiskey Society. Uh, have a great weekend, everyone, and we'll see you soon. Slanjava from everyone in the channel. Slanjava. Wow.